Welcome to the 2012 keynote address. My name is Mark Lococo. I'm the Vice President for Conference 2012. The first time I spoke to Dale Orlander Smith over the telephone, almost the first words out of her mouth were, I hope you're not asking me to speak because you expect me to be a credit to my race or my gender. <laughs> this caught me a little bit by surprise because I think uh, we're often conditioned to think that's what keynote entails. But as the conversation continued, that introduction made much more sense to me as I became more acquainted with Dale's ideology, her passion, and her keen insights into human nature. Dale Orlando Smith grew up in public housing in East Harlem. Her father passed away when she was young and her mother sent her to parochial school in spite of the difficulty and expense that this caused on the family. In the late 60s and early 70s, East Harlem was dangerous. In a way though, Dale found focus in learning. In an interview, she once said, I have always been work oriented, even when I was a child. At 10, I was writing a journal, reading voraciously, listening to music. For a while in her teens, she worked with the New York Poets Cafe. In the 80s, she enrolled in Hunter College for a while and settled in the East Village and took acting classes. She began to write her own characters for performance assignments. After tours of Australia and Europe as a performer writer with the New York Poets in the early 90s, she worked with the Sundance Theater Laboratory at Salt Lake City. In 1995, she wrote and performed the play Beauty's Daughter, which won her an Obie Award. She followed that with The Gimmick, which was commissioned by the McCarter Theater and also staged at the Long Wharf Theater and the New York Theater Workshop. The Gimmick was a solo show about Alexis, a girl in Harlem who befriends Jimmy when both are eight years old and follows them for years. Both dream of artistic careers and a life in Paris. Alexis is a writer and Jimmy is a painter. The Gimmick of the title is the constant lure of drugs and sex and easy money that destroys many of the people around them and eventually Jimmy himself. Charles Isherwood called this play an often deeply affecting tribute to the transforming power of language and learning and the people who steadfastly believe in their promise in an environment where more immediate and visceral gratification continually beckon. Her next show, Monster, was first produced at ACT in Seattle. In it, she performed nine characters in the life of Teresa, a young woman in Harlem who looks out her window one day to see a mother beating a child on the street. She runs out and stops the abuse, but's led to reflect on three generations of abuse in her own home. In an article about her work in the New York Times, Dale wrote, there's a theme throughout the work that I write about childhood and the sins of the father, the sins of the mother, and how people take on the very thing they don't like about their parents and they become them. Her next play, Yellow Man, represented a slight departure in that it was her first play performed by more than one actor. Commissioned and first performed at the McCarter in 2002, it then ran successfully in New Haven, Philadelphia, Seattle, and finally landed off-Broadway at the Manhattan Theater Club. Yellow Man earned a Pulitzer Prize nomination for drama in 2002. The play is a love story set in coastal South Carolina and addresses black-on-black -black racism. Critics wrote most favorably of both her performance and the playwriting. Ben Brantley wrote, the harsh, sadly hopeful love story that unfolds within this context is both simple and complex. Orlando Smith's descriptions of childhood, friendships, and frictions that develop into romance would seem commonplace were it not for her ear for a cadenced language steeped in both sweet melody and earthy physicality. Her most recent work, Black and Blue Boys, Broken Men, ran at Berkeley Rep this past November and she'll perform it at the Goodman in Chicago uh, this upcoming season. The San Francisco critic said of the piece, magnetic and versatile can't quite convey the mesmerizing intensity of Dale Orlander Smith on stage or the very ease with which she transforms herself into characters of every age, ethnicity, shape, or gender. The writing is fierce, uncompromising, and alive with sharply observed humanizing detail. The characters are indelible. Orlando Smith is a riveting performer with an urgent tale to tell. Another critic said, Orlando Smith lends this play such a piercing sense of honesty that it's hard to believe it's not documentary drama. There's no shaking the intensity of the experience. Dale herself put it best when she stated, people don't understand that darkness is just as normal as light. 
There's creativity that comes from there. And I love that. I deal with darkness through writing. Ladies and gentlemen, Dale Orlander Smith. Okay. There's a reason why I did that. Besides plugging the show. <laughs> um, and I do these shows. I wonder why I can't get a date on a Saturday night. <laughs> um, the name of the piece, the, the excerpt from this is a piece called Black and Blue Boys, Broken Men. And I play all men that have been abused. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why I'm hooking this up into the educational system. And into the people system. And into the audience system. Um, and this, it, you know, Mark made a few mistakes, but that's okay. He's a nice guy. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to, we're going, we, I actually did this in the summer. I did, you know, the last performance was a month ago, and then now I go September 28th to the Goodman with this piece. We had talkbacks after this piece. I mean, for obvious reasons. A lot of times there were people, you know, first of all, the audience asked for it. And, you know, there were people who were survivors of, um, Abuse, because again, this is sexual abuse, this is emotional abuse, the whole thing. At one of the talkbacks in Berkeley, this is at Berkeley Rep, man raised his hand, he said, Dale, he said, have, we are a predominantly white, upper middle class audience. Have you ever done this before people of color? And I said, why are you asking me this? And he said, well, because we're a white, middle class, and I said, I'm going to cut you off right there. I said, because within this piece, you have black people, you have white people, you have Hispanic people. Why are you just zeroing in on the black and Hispanic people? And he goes, well, you have the low class Irish. I said, oh, we're really going. I said, what about you know, Mark Sadusky? And he didn't want to go there. And then he said something interesting. He said, I removed myself. And we were talking some more. He and his wife were going back and forth with this. And I said, what is it that the both of you do? And he said, we're school teachers. And I said, you're very dangerous to this profession. <laughs> I said, um, the role of theater and the role of any classroom or anybody within a classroom, but let's talk theater, because also let's talk dark theater, all kinds of theater. The role of any theater person, <laughs> any teacher, we're supposed to be mental and emotional travelers. It's not simply about Spider-Man, and even Spider-Man in terms of people who want to see spectacle. The reason why people are checking out the spectacle is no longer about Spider-Man, it's about what actor is going to break their neck that night. Yeah. Bringing back, the bringing back of old um, plays just for the sake of a named director or a star actor. The theater has to be, as Liz Ashley says, a very dangerous place. We're supposed to be taking chances. So when someone like that and his wife goes into a classroom, or go, what they're doing is, with their own bias, they're blocking, they are stopping, they are killing <coughs> those students that are coming to them and asking them to help give me a voice. And they're doing it in ways that are so dangerous. And the irony of it is, he and his wife, well, his, not so much him, his wife is a theater person. So she sent me a letter talking about how do I challenge my students. I said, before you challenge your students, why don't you challenge yourself? When people are limited like that, and I'm somebody who had to deal with uh, teachers who, who, who treated me that way, the first draft of Yellow Man was actually written close to 30 years ago. I was told by the, the, this, this educator not to do this because I would offend people. But I think there's a, there's a great uh, thing by Emerson, a great quote by Emerson. Heat creates friction, which generates light. I think that we are supposed to give ourselves permission to be uncomfortable, because that's part of the human condition. And we're supposed to be seeing that on a stage. Other stuff in terms of black and blue boys, I'm going with this, had a Feminists come up to me and say to me, well, one of your characters was molested by a woman. I said, uh-huh. And she says, I can't see where that can happen. <laughs> and so she said to me, Dale, are you a feminist? And I said, I'm a humanist. That includes feminism. 
I said, but what you're talking about is convenient feminism. And then she said to me, she says, well, I don't have a penis. I said, you may not have a penis, but it sounds to me like you have a pretty aggressive vagina. <laughs> and I had to point out to her that, again, if we're going to look at it this way, that kind of ism, the sexism and the racism, you come into a classroom again, you're dangerous. And I, said, and I gave her a few examples of people that molested, and actually she taught poetry. And I said, well, one of the top poets, one of the most famous poets in the world, Anne Sexton, molested her daughter. There's a book called Searching for Mercy Street, which was written by Linda Gray Sexton, and also Diane Middlebrook, who's actually an editor of both Anne Sexton's work and of Sylvia Plath's work, wrote this. And you know, Linda Gray also wrote about this. So again, what I'm saying is the long short of it is, when we get caught in our own fear, we play into the isms. And therefore, we stop production. We stop what's good. We stop theater people. We stop good theater. We get locked into our own genre of thinking, and it extends itself to these kids who are coming to us and asking us to help give voice. You follow me so far? Some of you agree with me. Some of you are going, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I'm also nervous, so bear with me. I'm a ham, but so. Um, I think what happens is this. It's like, you know, this is, and this is, this is the, the eternal question. What happens is when someone comes on a stage and they give us permission to go to a dark place, and how do we individuate that using the Jungian term? How do we individuate that information and not use it, or how do we use it? The theater needs to have younger, Voices, more diverse voices, more women, more people of color. So how do we give birth to that? And how, you know, how, how do I also, that, and that's my question too, how do I do it? And I think also by hanging out with younger people and also being open and looking at my own isms. I, as I teach, and I, I, and, I, and I teach as well, I have one student, I was, I was telling Mark about this earlier today. He was writing about a gay man. He is a gay man. And he chose to write this gay man very effeminate with a bunch of one-liners. And I said, now you're being homophobic. I don't want to see this shit. I want to see a beginning, a middle, an end, a story, a conflict, a resolution. I want to know why this person is talking to me. I don't want to see cliches. Because also when people think in a very small way, what happens is this. They're not asking their students to challenge themselves. I've been called by, I've been called a lot of things, but I've been called by <laughs> one woman in terms of yellow man said, you're not, you're, how could you write quote unquote darker skinned people this way? People often when they come to the theater, they're not looking at the overall picture. They want their individual sense of justice at the expense of somebody else's overall truth. <coughs> now I said, I'm glad you didn't kill your kid because you, you, you said I didn't kill my child, I didn't do any of those things. But theater is not supposed to be this way. And also, again, when you have someone who's thinking like that, they don't give, as uh, Emily Dickens says, possibility. I sat in on a class of hers, and I saw a lot of cliched stuff. I'm saying, look at the world. Like any group of people, black people are a melting pot within a melting pot. We are multicultural. We are multi-ethnic. Why does it have to be, and some of you may get mad at me for saying this, and I'm going to say this. It doesn't just have to be the Southern sharecropper experience, the urban ghetto experience. Like any group of people, we are Catholic, we are Muslim, we are, we are atheists, we are a lot of different things. We are European. When we keep ourselves in the box the same way I told my student that was gay, we will play in, that's the only work that will get done. When we do not step outside of the box, you know, lack of integration means eventual extinction. So if we just keep containing ourselves and containing ourselves and not looking at the melting pot as a whole, we fuck up. There was a great story that I heard and I gave to a student once. Some of you who are writers watch you steal this now, right? <laughs> uh, Leonard Bernstein, this is, a, this is a, this one of my students who was writing about blue, black student was writing about blue, right? And so I said, okay, what are you writing? And he says, oh, I'm writing this blues thing. And I said, okay, here's a story for you. Try to see what you can do with this. 
Leonard Bernstein was on a bill with a very famous musician. And the musician said, I want this music to sound orange. So Leonard Bernstein's like, what the hell? You know what? And so he goes and he watches this musician. And the musician, sure enough, he said, made it sound orange. And he and that musician hung out for three days talking music. The person he was talking about was Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix told him that he was influenced by Stravinsky. Stravinsky, when Stravinsky lived with uh, Coco Chanel, he did for a hot second in the late teens, early 20s. He went to go see Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake. And he told Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake, you guys remind me of Beethoven. Do you understand the connections that I'm talking about, right? Um, somebody who I befriended who was wonderful, August Wilson, we all know that he was great. People talk about August Wilson in reference to the blues. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But I also sat down with August Wilson who recited Fern Hill like I'd never heard anyone recite it before. And also he actually told me, he said, the whole thing with the canon came from Eugene O'Neill. When Eugene O'Neill wrote um, All God's Children Got Wings and Emperor Jones, he studied African history and he studied jazz. When he wrote The Hairy Ape, he also studied um, kabuki theater because he was interested in how the way the face moves. In kabuki theater, what happens is this, is that the actors do not reach for masks until they feel the character come through them. So this is what I mean by connections, and this is what I mean when I say to anyone, you, no person in this room can speak for an entire race or an entire sex, because when you do, you compartmentalize and you play into the very bias that you're trying to get out of. It is about universalism. So that's what I mean when I say that stuff. So, did you follow what I just said? <laughs> right? So listen, that's enough of me waving. So Mark, come up here, because I think I've said enough. I'm going to ask you. Hi, that was uh, extremely powerful watching you perform those pieces. Thank you. I'm wondering how you feel in your body after you do a performance like that. How do you hold on to those kind of feelings? How do you release those kind of feelings that come up in performing such dark material? I mean, this, this piece is one of the most, the, the hardest, one of the hardest pieces that, you know, that, I, that I've written. And it's, you know, it's, and I'm not going to lie to you, it's not, it's not easy to come off of it, you know, but I, I do yoga, and as foul as my mouth is, I meditate, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so it does kind of help. I go to the gym. I like red wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how. I'm going to ask a, a related question. How do you come up with the material? Is it based on talking to people? Is it? Yes and no. Uh, years ago when I was, um, uh, years, I worked as a, a social worker. At one point. Actually, it wasn't even social work. I worked in a, as a counselor in a runaway shelter. And something that had happened was I'd hear like boys talk about being molested. And no one really, and they still don't really take that seriously. And um, it kind of stayed with me. And I also question stuff about gender and people stuff. Because see, just to throw in one thing that I'd forgotten to tell you guys is that this piece, male or man or woman can do this and anyone of any race can do this. And the reason why it's written that way is because there's stuff that's simply human. I do believe that there is an androgyny. I, uh, I believe in certain cases where, what we call male and female is very visual and very, very apparent. A lot of times the stuff is just indelible. So I really wanted to look at it in terms of like how we, we, men, men and women, look at manhood and how also, ladies get mad at me if you want, 
there, women can also be sexist. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, well, see, you, see, you don't hear that, you know. In Berkeley, I had to have, almost had a fist fight. <laughs> I'm not playing around. So that's why I wanted to, that's, that, that's, that's why I wanted to address it. Because this boy talked about how, see, here we go. And I said this earlier to someone. When you have an older man, say, looking at, just looking at this in reference to black and blue boys, right? When you have an older man, say, with a child that's, a child, or someone who's young, male or female, we say it's molestation. When you have an older woman, particularly with a young boy, we say that's initiation. Sexist, sexist as hell. When we look at pictures of, say, like, um, there's a great book by a guy called Richard Gartner called Betrayed His Boys. Get that book, yeah? And in that book, he talks, of, he gives examples of things like Tea and Sympathy, Summer of 42. We don't call that molestation. We call that initiation. And even though, say, like something like a graduate, right? Benjamin is legal, but he's barely legal. And he has that line, Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me, dot, 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 aren't you? And you see, it has nothing to do with, uh, respectively, Anne Bancroft and Kathleen Turner. We don't like Mrs. Robinson, but Mrs. Robinson is made very sexy. So I really want to look at like the gender stuff in terms of how it permeates everything that we do. This is my last question. I don't mean to hog the microphone. But when you are making a person who is of a different race or gender than yourself, mm -hmm. do you have a methodology by which you approach that performance? What do you mean? How do you play a man? Do you do you approach playing a man differently than playing a woman in terms of the work that you do with your body or voice? Yes, to a certain degree. Yes. Is there a methodology to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the man in me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Yeah, hi. That, was, that was awesome. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Um, so as someone who, actually, you performed at New York in Poets Cafe? Yeah, I did. A, while back. a while back, yeah. I haven't done it in a while. The good thing is I'm working, so. Hey, I mean, that's great. Well, I don't mean that in a bad way, you know. I, I love New York in Poets Cafe. Um, I just did, like, my first performance there a little while ago. Nice. And it, it's a really cool place. So as someone who um, is pursuing sort of a similar kind of performance, this is a great venue, this is a great audience to have for this kind of performance, but where else and where did you find... Um, the venues to do this kind of thing. I mean, it's See, what, controversial. I, I, but, I, I mean, I was an actor when I was a teenager. Okay. And I was with New Eureka when I was a teenager, then I left and I came back. And I trained American Academy of Dramatic Arts and stuff like that. So I, you know, I, I'd done that. At that time in the 90s, what was happening was there were a lot of open mics and then people would come up and they'd say, can you do something at, you know, ABC No Leo and can you do such and such, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's what happened. I, I don't, um, I don't know. That's, that's, it, was, it was timing at that particular point, so I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that's a pretty good answer. I mean, there's like tons of like open mic stuff that I'm finding. Well, Dixon Place. I'm sorry? Dixon Place. Dixon Place? Is that Dixon. in New York or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, I, I don't mean to like have that conversation. Yeah, Dixon Place. Yeah. But, okay, cool. So I'll keep looking. Thanks. You're great. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Uh, I, I was kind of interested to hear the term melting pot and moments later you talk about August Wilson and you seem to have rather different ideas than he does about race in America, I guess you could say. I sometimes play the PBS uh, documentary he did with Bill Moyer to my classes mm -hmm. and I have actually sort of backed off of doing that because I don't know how to speak with them when he says things like... Why don't you just ask? Pardon? Why don't you just ask questions? See, this is part of the problem. Why don't you... It's, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. It's the type of questions that people ask. And when people keep themselves so alienated from, you play into your own ignorance. I spent... One of my characters... I spent a lot, I've spent a lot of time in Ireland, right? And one of, my, one of the characters that I play in the piece is from Belfast. Now, I spent more time, say, in Dublin. This was in the 90s and the early 2000s. I asked people, but as someone who interacts with all kinds of people, I'm not dating anybody right now, but anybody, as someone who dates all kinds of guys, 
as someone who listens to all kinds of music, I'm not that narrow in my scope, and I know what questions to ask. And if I do not listen to all kinds of music and read all kinds of literature and interact with all kinds of people, I keep myself stupid. Okay, I guess my problem has been, and maybe it, maybe I am stupid. Is, I'm not calling you stupid. Is when I ask, you know, when I ask for their reactions, what I get from from the students of all races is August Wilson is a racist. That no, is, he's not. That is their response to me. And, How is he racist? Well, because it, he does say that he doesn't believe that the African American culture should melt into the melting pot. But it is. It so, has. Uh, he okay. and I have, he's not a, I mean, I, so I, I can't, I can't go, I'm not going to go, go about, I understand what you're saying. No person can be a subject. You know, again, because he would, had it not been for Eugene O'Neill, he wouldn't be, he, had, he wouldn't have wrote, written what he's written. That canon is from, like, like I told you, you know, I sat here. He could, he can recite Fern Hill like I've never heard it before. He can sit down and he can recite Yeats. He wishes for the claws of heaven is unbelievable coming from August. So I, I, th I think there was a divide because also, you know, again, with all respect to him, he was mixed race. He was born in 1941. To be a mixed race man, say in the 50s, in the early 60s, is a whole different thing in terms of being a mixed race person now. And we didn't even use that term mixed race. And I really do think that there was, you know, there's some stuff that he had to work out. Because again, often what happens with race and all of that, people, and, and, and ethnicity, people are quote unquote forced to choose, opposed to embracing all. So I think that has a lot to do with that. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, you talked about um, you have to take it to a dangerous place, and uh, this, I'm prefacing this because I, um, I played Father Flynn in Doubt, and I t um, it does go to a dangerous place. And I, my question is, how do you deal with audience members who have been so taken to that dangerous place that, uh, and I'm talking about in dialogue or in conversation afterwards, they're so affected that they're obviously deeply wounded, and a wound has been exposed. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you deal with it? Because, for, for instance, um, a, an audience member after the show came up to me and spit at me in the face. Uh, clearly, I mean, I, I, there's, there was nothing that I could do about it other than walk away, I felt. But Did have you? you ever... No, I mean, I, I, I could see that they were still... I mean, and that's... I don't know, because I didn't know how to exactly respond to it without wounding the person any, either, anymore or... It was just, it was, and that's, I, I, I guess I'm ignorant in that sense that yeah. I don't know how to deal with the audience when they come and, and interact with me in that way. Where were you? Uh, this was in Houma, Louisiana. Uh, so this is, this is deep south of Louisiana. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that's someone, why I asked you, because I'm not, you know, I'm not being funny. I mean, a lot of times, you know, uh, geography has a lot to do with stuff, too. Yeah. Because, again, people aren't used to seeing a certain kind of theater. And that, I mean, the word, that's why I mean when I say I speak to, I don't speak for it's a given that I am black. It is a given that I'm female. I do not have the right, and it's a given that, like say with black Americans, with a lot of black people, we, we share a history. But I am also an individual. You and I may function in the world totally differently, but yet we share the same history because we're different people. You know? So this is what I'm saying, right? Uh, the word that I use is boundary a lot. Black and blue boys, I'm speaking to you, I'm not speaking for you. Right? Mm -hmm. And I, at sometimes, like after the shows, I would get people. This one man was following me, and um, he was following me for two blocks, right? And I turned around, I said, My friend, I'm about to drop you, right? <laughs> and so he, um, but I was scared. I mean, I have a lot of mouth, but I get scared. Don't think I don't get scared, because people who are not afraid, they scare me, right? And so he, what he said to me was, he says, I'm not going to hurt you. He goes, but I want you to know I saw the play. I'm one of your boys in the play. And then he said, what do I do with all this pain? And I said, well, and, and in, the, in the thing we have, you know, like, you know, male survivor, you know, there's, there's an organization called Male Survivor. And we give a list of people who we can talk to. But that to this day, and that's only been actually about six weeks, I still don't know, because I know I'm going to get that. 
and I don't know what to do with that. Now, in terms of somebody spitting in my face, I know what to do with that. <laughs> I don't play that. That's ridiculous. That's really, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. That, I mean, to, to, to a physical confrontation is something, no. That's that, you didn't hit him? No. I guess because I, I, I didn't see the spit as, 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 as an act of violence, but more as I could definitely see the wound in his eyes. And I didn't want to take that further. Did you, was there a way to talk? No, we were, they were sort of, we were being ushered sorry. out, especially after that. The, I'm so the, sorry. The just said, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, the, I mean, I, I have, and I have to, I mean, what we're going to do, is, what, plan on doing is, I'm working with this woman, Tanya, and we're, who works at uh, the Goodman, and we're trying to set some, you know, uh, talk back, and that's all we can do, you know, but yeah. See, and also, this is what I mean, ah, and actually, this is where this audience responsibility comes in too, right? Because again, when somebody blocks out something, or here we go, American audiences are very, we're, you know, aesthetically we're quite young. And so a lot of times in Europe, people get that it's, I'm not saying that it's utopian, I'm just saying it's just simply a given, where people in Europe get the fact that, you know, this is a story, not the story. We're speaking to you, we're not speaking for you. And we know what to do with this, because culturally, you know, we're very rich, we're very rich too, but we're just coming into our own in certain ways. So in Europe, you know, a lot of times this stuff just simply doesn't happen. It doesn't have to be representational. It is, and people know how to take that information or know. Yeah? I'm sorry that happened, though. 